Welcome back, everyone, and welcome to another We Are One, You Are Two, PlayStation and Video Game Podcast. I am your host, as always, Robert Fanzo, joined once again this week by Mr. Matt Rhodes. Matt, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. Good to hear. Yeah, I'm enjoying gaming. I'm excited about what we have in store for today. I am too. Uh, man. As soon as we're done with this, I can go play more Fortnite because they just released new challenges on the day uh, that we're recording. You know what I mean? What am I going to do with you? Play Fortnite with me, you, you, you and the 40 million other people, I guess. Actually, right? I also need to check out Rocket League because they, because they updated their their past now, too. Wow. Their, X, they, um, their XP system came out uh, the 29th, which was yesterday, the day we were recording this. Yeah. So I have to, I have to check out Rocket League and see what, what their deal is. We I mean, have to check that out, too. I'm going to... I'm going to probably dive into some Dead Cells this weekend, I think, and, and maybe some uh, more Neo. I'm surprise, in a, a roguelite uh, punishing mood, I guess. Yeah. Something's wrong <laughs> with me, I guess. And maybe some We Happy Few. I, I, I think they patched the the quest that I was frustrated with, and so we'll see. I'll have to look at Redbox and see if they have it in my area because I got sent a free like you know game rentals with them. So Yes, I did too. So it took good to like the 6, right, or something crazy? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's like... Oh, it was them like trying to like, I don't know. It was through text messages like, "Oh, we have uh, we're trying to figure out like what what systems people want games for for the Redbox." Yes, I got that same text. Yeah, and then re- you know re- reply to the systems that you have, so, and then they sent me a, a thing about a free game night. So hopefully, somewhere in my area has We Happy Few, so I can try that out. Absolutely, and and if you're not playing We Happy Few and you're not going to the Redbox, you should. But before you go do that, stop by your computer, rate us first and foremost on iTunes. Go listen to us on Google Play, Stitcher, Patreon, Podbean, YouTube. We try to do it every week by Sunday or Monday. Sometimes we're a little late. Sometimes we're a little early. So it's always a surprise for you. Uh, but I do also want to mention that if you like what you hear today, because we're going to speak with a very special guest shortly, uh, you can join us on our Podbean Patreon or on Patreon itself as a sub. And Matt, if you do that, you get cool perks. What? You get perks? Yeah, you- Sweet. Perks. Perks, yeah, P E R K S, perks. I love perks. Rhymes with jerks. Those are the people that don't subscribe. That's right. Uh, you can get stuff like voting on topics we talk about. You can get suggestions about the industry talent that you want us to bring to the interview table. I'll read your name off at the conclusion of every podcast. I'll make Matt read it off in some sort of weird voice in our credits section. Yeah. We'll start doing that. Um, you'll get first access to us and even contribute to a subs only podcast that we'd like to do just for you guys once a month. You can look at our tiers, consider giving us a dollar a month, that's $12 a year, and then you get all that really cool stuff, and we have different tiers for even more cool stuff if we can get enough people going with this. And so head over to Podbean. If you have the app, you can actually become a patron while you listen to our podcast. And if you don't have that and you want to subscribe subscribe to us over on Patreon, it's the same perks both places. Uh, It just helps us uh, get the word out about this podcast. And Matt, we've got a really awesome, awesome guest today. We have Rachel Messer, so we're going to talk with her very shortly here. Yes. She's got quite a bit to tell us about uh, Forgotten Anne, which is a game that I adored this year. Um, It's probably in my top five games this year, if not one of my games of the year so far. Um, It's up there with God of War and everything for me uh, because I was so pleasantly surprised by it. Just And her, we'll talk about this, but her acting in it is phenomenal. And so is the gentleman that plays Fig. He did a great job as well. Um, so I would love to have him on if he's listening or if somebody can tweet at him. If you can find his Twitter, I couldn't find it. Um, so she talks to us about that. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of her other stuff. She does a lot of anime as well, including uh, one of my favorite anime um, mangas that I've, or mangas that I've read, um, Tokyo Ghoul. And so uh, we'll talk to her about uh, all kinds of roles and things that she's got going on. Sounds good to me. I'm ready to get into it. Yeah, let's do it. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us here on our uh, Inside the Industry interview. Uh, This week, we have Rachel Messer with us. Rachel, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. 
We are glad you're uh, able to stop by and spend a little bit of time with us today. And so uh, we're excited to have you. Um, probably me uh, more than anything, uh, just because I just finished Forgotten Anne about a week ago. And so we'll talk about that. Hmm. We always like to have our guests talk a little bit about themselves and get to kind of uh, let our audience know who they are and what and what they uh, where they come from, kind of what what how they got started with everything. And so, uh, and it, you know, we, we'll talk about your work and talk about everything you've done before and and where you're at and where you're going. Uh, but we always just like to get a little a little bit more personal and just get to know you as a person as well. So feel free to tell us anything about yourself that you you think uh, that our listeners would love to know about you. Sure, but I'm super boring. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. Oh, you're you're kind. Um, hi, my name is Rachel Messer. Uh, I started voice acting when I was 22. Uh, before then, I was a competitive gymnast for about 12 years. I was two levels away from Olympic level till I got knocked out by an injury. Wow. And then I was going to join Cirque du Soleil. And then I got a couple auditions for them. And then I decided I didn't, didn't want to do that. Um, and so I just kind of I do things and stuff. I'm just horrible about talking <laughs> talking about myself. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, you said you were born, but I think uh, competitive gymnast, my sister would love that because she uh, she did that for so many years until she tore her ACL. Yeah, it's a hard sport on people's bodies. It is. And then Cirque du Soleil, I don't think, I don't think it's every day I meet somebody that says they tried out for that. Or, <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. That's an intense life. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like they just, they're just constantly having to, stretching i don't know just like they're just i don't know this lifestyle seems so intense to mm-hmm. like body like just some of their body shapes are just insane like they're so tiny but yet so muscular and strong and it's just it's crazy mm-hmm. i don't think i've ever i've never been to a Cirque du Soleil show so what? i don't know well, i know of it i don't know any I've oh my gosh they're, they're they're amazing what's weird is i haven't either <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're so good so you tried out for one not knowing yeah pretty much <laughs> It was just That's like, great. oh, this is a thing. Like, I grew up thinking it was really cool. I had a poster on my wall. Uh, and then at like 20, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I was like, well, let's give this a shot. And I, I went out to to Las Vegas and, and tried out. That's awesome. That was awesome. We were we were talking about, uh, you know, you mentioned about being uh, competitive or were competitive gymnast and tried out for Cirque du Soleil when you were 20 because you weren't, you were trying to figure out where you were going. Mm-hmm. Now you're a voice actor. Now you're pretty established with that. And so... What made you jump into voice acting? What made you kind of, what drew you to it? Uh, what, what kind of give us a little bit of back, backstory on that. So uh, I was an actor in college. It became an acting major in all of my search for things. Originally, I think before that I was going to be a baker. Uh, and then I switched to actor. Um, <laughs> and then about three years into my degree, I realized uh, that I, there wasn't a huge market for, for what I was going to do. I wanted to do like film or theater. Um, and so I was, having this huge crisis of like, what, oh, what do I do? Um, And a friend of mine was like, well, you do a lot of weird voices. Why don't you just do voice acting? Which I decided to take as a compliment. And I (laughs) went back to my dorm room and I Googled voice acting auditions. uh, And I came across two sites that kind of aren't around anymore. There was a site originally called Voice Acting Alliance, which just, uh, just went under, sadly. And then uh, this site is still around, but the, the option isn't there as Funimation had this little thing that was like, are you an actor? Why don't you fill out this thing and maybe we'll call you in. <laughs> I don't think that's around anymore either. <laughs> yeah, I'd say the uh, voice acting thing seems to have really uh, exploded over the last, uh, even more so, I think, than because of the amount of media that's out there now mm-hmm. versus maybe 20 years ago. But that's awesome. So you just one thing one thing led to another. You just kind of found yourself auditioning for stuff, or uh, so I went home in complete naivety, uh, and I was like, "I'm gonna audition for everything." And then I did that, and I think like I maybe got one role in my first week, which was like a ten dollar part, which sounds like so great, like oh, I got a role my first week, but I auditioned for at least eighty things in that first week. <laughs> And then I just kind of stuck with it because I was having fun. And over time, it started to make money. And then I became self-employed with it. Uh, and then I'm here somehow. It's just a really weird where the wind takes shit kind of thing. That's awesome, though. Yeah, that's really awesome. <laughs> do you... Uh, so you are... You act in, in games, but do you play them? And if so, what kind of games do you, are you into? So I used to be really addicted to this game called League of Legends. Um, so I played that like 
gosh. I, I know once I played for like seven hours straight with a group of friends. And so I, I played that pretty, pretty uh, frequently for about two years. And then I kind of, I moved to, a, they, I think they actually switched server locations to Chicago and I never got really good connection after that. And that kind of stopped me from playing, uh, which is probably for the better because I was spending like six hours a day playing. <laughs> <laughs> now I play, I'm trying to beat Super Mario Sunshine because I never beat that uh, when, I was a, when I was younger. So I'm trying to figure that out. And I'm just kind of going back. I love like GameCube games and uh, Nintendo 64, like that, that kind of stuff. And uh, even like some Wii, but I, I play a lot of those and I'm trying to go back and just beat, like I never beat Donkey Kong 64. I tried to re like I, I tried to replay through that when I was like 22, back when I still had time because I was in college and uh, <laughs> I, I didn't make it through there either. I have not. I think I've succeeded at beating Pikmin, which was not super hard. Uh, but that was my first goal was to go beat Pikmin. <laughs> I give you credit. I, <laughs> when, when it's an older, I mean, that's great to be, be able to play retro games like that because when I, I don't know if it's just me or what. I'm sure Matt's the same way, but I always tell myself I'm going to go back to older games and then I never do. It's just kind of, it's like, a, I guess, some fantasy I have that I'll, I'll go back someday and play games I've never played or finish games I never pl- finished. So that's great that you actually, you know, have an appreciation to be able to go back and do that and, and try that out and make that work. I, I'm kind of forced to in a way. Like on the one hand, I'm a huge nostalgia person. Like I think I tweeted the other day a picture of, my fiance and I got our, our Pokemon cards out and we were playing the old trading card game. I saw that. Yeah. So I'm like really into the nostalgia of it all. Uh, but I get severe motion sickness with some of the new games. Like I can play Left 4 Dead for some reason or another. I, I found out I can play that one. But like anything new gives me severe motion sickness. Um, mm. Smite I was okay with. It's just like every, random games make me make me sick and I, I can't finish them. So the older games, I know I can, I can handle fine. Huh. I don't know if it's the graphics were worse back then or what. <laughs> <laughs> Is it easier for your brain to disconnect because it doesn't look as real? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. You play, you definitely play games. Um, I'm kind of curious then when you started voice acting, did you know you wanted to get into games? Did you know you wanted to do commercials? Like, because you talked about 80 auditions mm-hmm. and obviously you, you had played games, right? Growing up, it sounds like a little bit and, and certainly through college, you know, did you, is that something that crossed your mind or did you, were you more of i uh, I've, I've got to get into TV and, and film or was there a certain direction you were thinking of when you originally started <laughs> into the voice acting? You think I had way more planned than I did. <laughs> you were just throwing it at the wall. <laughs> I really was. I didn't, I never thought it like, even when I had like wildest day- daydreams, like I think I got cast in a fan dub once and I was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. <laughs> and I, it never occurred to me that I would be able to do like real anime dubs and video games too. I was like, maybe I could get like some really, really indie games. But I, I didn't think it would take me to where it's taken me now. Um, and I, I don't know if that's a, a good thing or it's just a thing because I, I teach voice acting now. And one of the, the worst things I see new voice actors doing is putting this bar up for themselves to, to hit. And they, they make it a milestone that they have to accomplish at a certain point. And I think if I would put that pressure on myself of I need to do this and reach this point versus I've just been kind of having fun and this is where it took me. I, I think if I'd put that pressure on myself, it would have driven me away from it. So it's probably for the best that I didn't think about like, oh, I could be doing this. I, they were so, it, it was such a, a pipe dream that I didn't really think about it. So if you don't mind me asking them, because um, if you're, you're just, you know, you're doing all this and, and trying this out, when did you, when did you realize or what was maybe the first role that you had that you realized that this was going to be something that you could be successful at? Oh, snap. Um, you know, because the, the weird thing about being an actor is like you go from role to role pretty frequently. And so you're never sure like, oh, this role is happening now, but it could be my very last. Uh, I could never get booked for work again. And it's a, it's a terrifying thought originally. And so for so long, I've just been focused on, I want to get more roles. I want to get, I want to get more things. And then it started to become like, I want to be self-employed with this. So I need to, I need to get the money and I need to get roles for that. And it's, it's weird because I've passed, I, I don't think it was until like last year, um, where it, actually probably December of 17, where I sat down and actually stopped for a minute. And I, I looked back and I was like, wow, 
I've been on the Disney Channel and I've recorded these animes for Funimation and I've been the lead in some of these things and I've done, you know, Warframe and Paladins. And it was at that moment where I kind of stopped because before then I was so focused on just going and, you know, focus on how far I could run before I even realized like how much distance I had traveled. Um, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. I, I like yeah. the way you phrased that actually. Yeah, that <laughs> makes perfect sense actually. So how do you, so how do you choose roles now then? Um, you know, how do you choose, because uh, I know we, when we talked to uh, Natalie, for example, she, she, she goes on and, and applies for different roles and things like that, but she's also uh, a little bit more conscious of certain roles that she takes on now. Mm-hmm. Um, is there is there a process you go through for that or, or something that you kind of do to kind of determine which roles you want to apply for or if you're offered one that you take? Yeah, it really depends on um, a couple of things. Like I've, I've never wanted and I've backed out of roles since the start of anything that portrays smoking as a, a positive connotation. So if there's just a character that's smoking and it's thought to be cool or something, I'll, I'll pull out of those roles. Um I've never done any uh, sexual sound roles. So that's a, a big factor, too. Um, but aside is like, oh, there's like. Is that you, Matt, with the fire? Yep. <laughs> Ooh, that's part of our podcast. It comes by at least once a <laughs> once a week. <laughs> once a week. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's Chicago. So there's always oh. sirens going off. Sorry about that. No, you're totally fine. Um. I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> you, you were <laughs> sorry. You were mentioning the roles that you, uh, you see, so no oh. smoking, no sexual. Yeah. Um, and now it's just kind of like I look for characters that I personally like, uh, characters that are going to be fun to play, kind of thing. Um, because there, there's a lot of characters out there that are just. Uh, what was it like? I, I don't want to like say anything and like offend game developers out there, uh, but there are just some characters that are just very, very bland. And no matter how how hard you try to like bump up, there's lines. There's only so much you can do with lines like "Hello, goodbye, see you soon," and it's it's just there's not like a lot of uh, depth to them. And so when I get characters right. like Forgotten Anne's a great example of a character that has like this huge emotional arc and goes through all these different things. Uh, that's something that I, I really get invested for and I get excited to record. Yeah. So let's let's actually talk about that a little bit, if you don't mind, okay. uh, because that was one of the things I was weighing on my mind is, you know, I've looked at um, your extensive resume. Right. And I was looking at like something like Moji in Paladins, where it's just a couple of shorter one liners, mm. which is c- kind of expected, I guess, in a way with something like that. Um, but how's that something like that compare to, or how do you, what do you do to prepare versus something like Forgotten Inn where there is, like you said, a huge character arc. She, she grows immensely. Um, she's on this giant journey, um, mm-hmm. that she learns a lot about herself and, and the world around her. You know, how, how do those two weigh or compare? Uh, so Moji's, uh, you would pick Moji. I, I adore Moji. <laughs> Moji's a, a character that like I went in with the voice, but I didn't know a whole bunch of, uh, with both, uh, kind of with both these characters. With Moji, I didn't know a whole bunch going in. They they had some audition lines and uh, I, I don't even know if they had, I don't think they even had artwork at that point. It wasn't until I walked in the studio that I saw like her artwork um, and, and the, the new lines and everything like that. And so with her, I just went in, like, they gave me a brief description of her and what she was like. And of course, then, uh, with both situations, I was working with the directors or the, the game developers through a patch, through like a phone patch or Skype or what have you. Um, so I could talk to them and they could explain the character and explain like, oh, she says these lines like this because of this. With something like that, like Moji, especially, uh, because of the game context, like, She's got different reactions to things, but there's mm-hmm. not necessarily a character growth because it's just a character in a very short section of time. It's it's for a battle. So uh, there's only a certain amount of things that can happen in that battle versus uh, Forgotten Anne, which is a much longer game span. Um, there are a lot of different things. It's more story driven than uh, than Paladin's type of gameplay is. So there's just a, it's like a different setup in that uh, regards. And then with Forgotten Anne, I, I got to work with the one of the game devs uh, constantly through Skype, and we would get on for maybe two hours, and he would read the lines opposite, and then I would uh, respond. And I think for the first first two sessions, it was really like hashing out the character, and if I was saying something like I, I think I tried to make her, I made her too too stoic, maybe, and then okay. we pulled her back, and we made her. Uh, then she became like too bratty, 
And so we were just trying to find <laughs> that, that happy medium. But what's great is after the first like two or three sessions, we really had her nailed and it wasn't, it wasn't something I think we recorded like 11 times. There were like 11 sessions and I'm, I'm just guessing a number here. We did it for like a, a half a year, maybe a year and a half, somewhere, somewhere in that ballpark. Now I've gotten distracted. I'm like, shh. <laughs> I'm so easily distracted. I'm like a butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> But so it was just, uh, it, you can get really involved with the, the script, especially something that is story based versus something that is more action based. And, and that, that would be the, the main difference. And I also didn't read the script beforehand of Forgotten Anne. I know that there are some actors that differ. There are some people that, and, and for me, it's, it's a, a subjective thing. Mm -hmm. With Forgotten Anne, I chose not to read the script beforehand because I, would have better genuine reactions. I, I would just get, especially two hours in, I'd just get in the character mindset and stay that way and have the genuine reactions to it. So when something happened, I think we only did two two sets of reads for most of the lines. So it was a genuine reaction of, of finding out news when things happened. And there are exceptions, like with anime, I will go find the source material, I'll go find the manga, um, because with a lot of it, it's like simul dubbing. So I know episode by episode what's happening. But if I need right. to know that my character is going to have a switch in like episode eight, I can find that out from the manga versus finding it out at episode eight that I was supposed to be a bad guy all along. And I could have hinted <laughs> at it through it. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask you about that, too, um, because you do you work with a lot of anime as well. And so I was kind of curious if the process was different for you. Yeah. The anime is uh, it's definitely a, a much different beast in the sense. I think when I first started working in anime, like lead roles versus just background stuff is I always got pulled back. I was going too, too far because of video game knowledge. Like video game was always so life and death and so much emotion. And they're like that, ah, pull it back. <laughs> she doesn't need to be that upset. She can, she can be just mildly upset. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty interesting. So with Forgotten Anne, obviously you said you didn't read the script, but is that, would you say that's the norm to get a full script for, for a game like that? Or is it, does it come at you in kind of pieces or uh, what's the process there as far as like knowing what you're supposed to be reading? Uh, it can be it can be either or. Actually, Forgotten Anne didn't come in in a solid piece. Uh, there were a couple of sessions where I think I got like two or three chapters. And then uh, even up to the call, they'd be sending me new scripts that might have something changed, uh, you know, little wording changed here and there. So Forgotten Anne, I, I did tend to get in chunks. And I think with longer games, that's more common. Sure. But there are other games that they're just like, here's the whole whole script or whole lines. And a lot of them, like, again, it's really subjective to the, the game dev. Like, Warframe just gave me my lines, and it's probably, it's because it's an action-based game. It's, mm -hmm. you know, lines that are said, uh, at, triggered by something, it's triggered by some kind of gameplay. Right. Versus story-based things like visual novels or Forgotten Anne or, or different games like that. Yeah, very cool. The other thing I guess maybe you can tell us a little bit about in regards to that and your preference maybe is we've, we've talked to other people too who have said that depending on their time schedule too that sometimes games take too much time because you mentioned six months to you know anywhere a year mm -hmm. with Forgotten Anne. I, I know that's probably just, you know, like you said, once a week or so. Uh, but do you find that there are certain maybe gigs that you do that are more time consuming that are uh, more difficult to allow you to have free time because I know you guys are often paid by the gig and everything like that. Is it right. certain ones eat up too much time and you kind of want to steer away from them because you're concerned about missing out on other opportunities? Yeah. Um, so there's this quote and this is not my quote uh, at all. I, I watch a lot of just random videos. And so um, I'm right now learning about like productivity hacks and, and managing time and all that kinds of stuff to try, try and get the most time out of everything because you're only uh, you really only got like an X amount of energy despite the fact that I've had two coffees and a ramen a today. You've only got <laughs> an X amount of energy and you have to work with what you've got. And you've also only got a certain amount of hours. I don't think, you know, even though I could be recording at 2 a.m. because I have a soundproof studio, I don't think my fiance is going to like that at 2 a.m. I get out of bed and I'm like, I'm going to go record now. <laughs> and yeah. also like there's there's time you want to spend with family. Like I spent a lot of time uh, for like a certain year of my career where I just had my head down and I was focused on career. And I was missing out on like a lot of what was going by. I looked back at the year and I could think of all the achievements I had done career wise, but as far as being like a well-balanced person, I was lacking that. I was lacking the uh, going out and hanging with friends or seeing my family or anything like that. 
Um, so I was working on trying to, to find more balance. But anyway, there's this quote that I, I came across in one of these videos that was, every time you say yes to something, you're essentially saying no to all these other things. And so that is very, very true in voice acting of I've had to turn down jobs because I was already booked for other jobs or, uh, you know, and most of the time with working actors, because we are going by by job and, and by gig and we're trying to be, you know, make a make a living doing this. A lot of the time, the higher paying gig will win out. I try to be and I think everybody does tries to be focused on, you know, who came first. But it, in a sense, like, you know. You, you've got to make a living. Food is always good. I really like food. <laughs> and so uh, there are certain games that I will look at. And yeah, I try to, some people ask my rates and I try to, you know, one, focus on budgets of indie games or any game really, because, you know, a, a game that is going to have one budget is not to, you know, if you're going to work for Kingdom Hearts, you can't want to charge the same amount for some game that's, it's their first their first game ever, and it's an indie game dev out of straight out of college. It's not a fair, a fair <laughs> rate. So I try to be subjective and understand that everybody has different budgets. But yeah, there there are times where uh, I'll ask, you know, what are what are the line the line count or what's the word count, and decide if that's something that for the that price I can manage time wise because it may take me, uh, you know, being generous, and I try to focus really hard on sending good audio and giving the, the best takes I can, no matter the project. I don't care if it's going to be played by, you know, 10 million people or four, four people, not four million. Uh, but I, I try <laughs> to do the very best for the, the game dev and the very best for the character's sake. And so because of that, like there, there is a certain amount where I, I just had a client I worked with, and this was actually not a game. This was a, a different project where I recorded a session and each session was supposed to take about 20 minutes, but because of the amount of lines and because of, uh, you know, how many takes they wanted and everything and, and retakes, it actually ended up taking me about two hours. And so the pay for what I was going to charge for 20 minutes versus two hours was not worth it. And now they've started coming back to me, asking me to, to redo characters. And I just can't fit that in my, not, you know, my time budget right now. Yeah. That seems to be the biggest budget that everyone tends to I don't want to say ignore, but forget about sometimes this time budget is just as important as anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Matt, why don't you go ahead? Because I totally lost what I was going to say just now. I got sidetracked too. I'm contagious. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, if you're... Go ahead, if you, go ahead, go ahead, okay. Go ahead. So you mentioned about <laughs> projects and things like... Sorry, you mentioned about projects and everything that you've been working on and respect to things like that. Um, and I noticed that, you know, one thing I'm kind of curious about, I guess, that made big, big deal a couple years ago. And, and I guess you got involved with it was System Shock, the System Shock remake. Oh, yeah. And then they put that on hiatus, correct? Back in like January, I want to say. Is it? This is news to me. I thought it was. Um, I guess what I'm asking is, and maybe that's why it might be news to you. Because I was trying to look information up about it because I know as Bioshock fans, I was excited about System Shock. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a Kickstarter, correct? Right. Yes. And then I think they just recently announced that they were going to start working on it again. But I was kind of curious in your role in that in the sense of I know you have it listed as Rebecca Lansing. Mm -hmm. Is that something where they have you re they've ha already had you record the lines? Is it something that you are just waiting to hear from them? From my understanding, uh, and this is going back to, uh, you know, conversations from maybe a year and a half ago. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm really trying to, to think about it. From my understanding, all of her lines are recorded unless there's oh, okay. other scenes that I'm not aware of. And maybe because they are still in development and, and changing things, maybe there are more. Um, I know on a stream, they asked me to play like a couple little voices here and there. And I haven't heard anything on that front. Uh, but from my understanding, all of Rebecca Lansing's lines are done unless they add something new. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious. I, I know it's been in and out of the news this year a little bit. Um, and they, they said something about maybe 2020 earlier in the year that that's mm -hmm. when it would be released. When I thought about that, I saw that you had done lines for it. I didn't know if, if that was something where they already gotten you to do the lines and it was other parts of development that were they were waiting on or if it was something where they hadn't gotten to you yet. And so... You know, that's that's something that you're still waiting on as well, because you mentioned about, you know, how different projects go different ways. But mm -hmm. um, if you already recorded it. Oh, yeah, I recorded it actually before the Kickstarter was launched. Oh, wow. OK. Yeah. And uh, I th I at least remember I recorded a couple of the lines and I believe again, I could be wrong, but I believe they had me come back and they had like a huge kind of 
essentially monologue because there was nobody else talking, but it was giving instructions. And I think you still can find there's a, a certain video where they've got like the gameplay trailer or gameplay demo and you mm-hmm. can hear her and uh, my character's voice in there. OK, awesome. Yeah, I was just we we're just curious. I mean, it's, it's one of those ones I'm looking forward to. And so I was it's interesting to think that you can have something done and then it's not. I mean, I guess that's a, a interesting thing for you, right, because you've moved on, done a lot of things probably since then. Um, but then to to know that that's still not out yet, that that's still something people will not hear your voice for at least another year or two. Mm-hmm. And uh, you you come across that. It's one of those things. I actually, I do think about it, not like constantly, but every now and then I'm like, oh yeah, like I wonder how that game is coming along. And I know that it's a big scale project and they're doing a lot with it. So with certain projects, you expect like a lag behind where you recorded. And sometimes, uh, I think I was talking to somebody about this last week. They asked, how in advance do you record the video game lines to when the video game comes out and honestly like i've recorded lines and two days later they were like in the video game um and then there's things like system shock where i recorded it years and years ago or years and years i i'm not even aware of when that was (laughs) i forget this year pretty frequently i'm i think i was signing like something and i was like oh it's still 2018 right like i didn't miss anything (laughs) Um, we didn't all start putting 19 down real quick. All right, cool. <laughs> but yeah, there, there are just certain projects that it, it takes a while. And, um, I knew with that one, because of the financial backing that it probably wouldn't go dead in the water. Right. But there are other ones where it's just, you know, one single, I, I had a client message me last month that I had auditioned for their game back in like 2015. And they got back to me saying, we'd like to book you for the part. Sorry, we've been on hiatus for three years. Wow. So there are projects that just show up. And then there are sometimes, you know, just one game dev who's working away and life happens. And maybe that game falls apart and you recorded lines and it just never, never sees the light of day. Hmm. That's crazy. Is there a particular project that you've been, um, because you, like I said, you do have an extensive resume. Is there a particular project that you've been super fond of that when you... Because I'm sure, you, you know, some are probably just by sheer volume that you do more memorable than others. Yeah. Uh, but is there one that really sticks out to you that you were like, man, I would, I'm so, I enjoyed that process so much. I enjoyed the lines or the characters. Is there one that really sticks out to you out of everything you've done? Yeah. Um. So anytime I work with high res who did like Paladins and Smite, they're always just an absolute joy to work with. Um. It's just a fun process. I, I don't feel intimidated or, or nervous or anything in the they guide you through it. They're just a super great team. And with that, like Infernal Ceres was fun just because like villain characters are evil. And she's just something that was very unique on her own. It was not something I was used to playing. And then, uh, you know, Moji was something different because I never get to really use my higher register. It's not something that comes up super often. So the Mm -hmm. fact that I got to go in there and do this like bubbly character was just absolutely fun. Um, Forgotten Nan, of course, was a, a big one. And in, in that same boat is a game called Epistory. And that game development group is also really, really nice. I think with Epistory, we did record. Uh, and I think I could be wrong. I, I hope I'm not. But I think they were in like Denmark. So our time zones were way different. And I was ending up getting up really early to record with them. And it was like kind of late for them. But we would record that game similar to Forgotten Anne, where I would, and it was just narration pretty much the whole time. Uh, but with Forgotten Anne and Epistory, they're both really, really near and dear to my heart because of the messages that are conveyed in that game. It's, uh, and there is, there's something to say about like fun games that you just go through and you play in the action games and something. But uh, when you really get to delve into games with heart and with, you know, a, a true purpose and especially a purpose you feel like you can get behind, uh, it's really encouraging yeah it's pretty awesome yeah it is so uh i guess the other and this is kind of off a little bit off of what we've been talking about because uh, i'm just kind of curious as a whole uh i noticed too recently that you've uh posted some stuff about uh you're japanese and so are you fluent or is this something you're learning i've been learning japanese uh on and off since my senior year of college so when did i graduate <laughs> Uh, like four years now. Um, It really depends on when you catch me in it because sometimes, and I think this was yesterday, I'm recording a uh, Japanese demo reel and I've done some video games for it and uh, some projects that I'm very, very excited to announce and cannot until next month. Uh, But when I do announce it, it'll make sense in this interview. 
um, what I'm alluding to. <laughs> <laughs> so ambiguous. I know, right? <laughs> they have to be. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really don't want to get in trouble. But so, um, you know, if I've been working in it a little bit, like yesterday where I was recording lines and stuff, um, I start thinking in Japanese. But then if it's been like six months and I haven't touched it or really thought about it or done any like studying, um, I will forget basic phrases and just be like, I knew that. Why do I know that? Or like, I'll be listening to something like a, an anime that's subbed or uh, I watched this show called Begin Japanology. And it's just about random things in Japan. It's things you don't think they could make a 30 minute episode about, but they somehow do. Uh, and I love it. <laughs> but they'll say something and uh, the translator won't have kicked in yet. And I'll go, I know, I know what that word means. I used to know what that means. Nobody tell me. It's like when you're trying to remember a band name or what the song name is or lyrics or something. And you're like, don't, I, I need to remember this. <laughs> yeah. So it really depends on just like how much I've been, you know, if I've brushed up recently on it or if it's something I've just kind of let sit. Awesome. Cool. Now, uh, you have your own studio. Is that correct? You have your own like booth rather. Uh, so explain the process of that. Because from the limited knowledge I have as far as like voiceover, I think of someone going into the studio and then obviously the sound editor being there and kind of uh, maybe the producer or whatever, and then them giving you kind of instructions. How exactly does that work for you if you're doing most of this from home? So it's really, really nice when you have a sound editor or uh, like anytime I go into Funimation, I just go in and I'm, you know, the director get you know gives me feedback and if they're happy with the lines, then we go on. And I know instantly that that is done, that we probably won't have to do patches unless like something comes out and the lip flaps are different, uh, especially with simuldubs, they're releasing uh, episodes as fast as they can. And so sometimes they come back and they refix animation frames and you realize that there's lines there that weren't there before or vice versa. Uh, normally that weren't there, but or like the mouth flaps weren't there before. Um, but with my studio, again, like th this is something that I think people can spend a lot of time on and it's such a like in debate kind of thing like some person is going to be very adamant that this is the very best microphone and somebody else might be very advocate that this other microphone is the very best microphone <laughs> so i just focus on like the basic things you know if you're trying to start your own home studio of find a quiet place so i took a walk-in closet and converted it into a, a studio and some people do that where they just have clothes up and anytime that there's like soft cloth, it kind of catches the echoes so you don't have as much echo back onto your microphone. But I, I did a lot more in here. Uh, so I've got three different types of soundproofing. I've got these sound deafening curtains. I've got, uh, and I've got three of those. They even cover the ceiling. There's not much space that isn't covered in soundproofing. Um, but what's great about that is it means that if there's somebody walking outside or, you know, uh, playing video games in my living room, it doesn't get picked up in here and vice versa. Like I could scream in here and do, you know, battle, battle cries and it's not going to get picked up in the living room. So it's really, really nice in that aspect because when I started in college, I did not have, I did not have this and I had to wait until there weren't cars going by or my neighbor wasn't right. walking or, or playing music or what have you. Um, so yeah, I've got that. I've got what's called a, a Grace 101 interface or preamp, sorry. And then just a Scarlet Solo interface. And I run everything through Adobe Audacity or Adobe Audacity, Adobe Audition. <laughs> Audition. <Yeah. laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. That's something Matt's going to have to look into so we can get rid of that ambulance every week. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 I think, I think the ambulance adds to the podcast. People, I feel like people expect it now. They, they expect it. Yeah. <laughs> Dave. That's to start putting it in there artificially now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rachel, I think I I don't know if there's anything else you really want to cover. I was I was going to just ask the usual kind of wrap up thing that we do, unless there's something else that you have, Matt. Well, yeah, just a little bit uh, expansion of that like question. Do you are you in contact since you're doing stuff mainly from your own your own place? Are you in contact with like directors or uh, or producers as far as like what they want from you, or is it more of they give you lines to do, you send it, and it's a back and forth with, oh, can you tweak this or can you tweak, can you tweak that? Or is it like uh, like a thing that's being done, like are you talking to them simultane simultaneously or is it more of a emailing back and forth? Or um, So it depends on the project. Like some, some direct uh, game devs do have the time to, to sit down and hop on Skype or hop on 
uh, Discord or what have you and actually talk you through and say like, you know, with Forgotten Anne where they would read the lines opposite or give you feedback online so you could tweak them right then and there. Um, other times and more common than not, you're just given a script and you give about three takes per line of how you think they could, you know, need the line and you kind of have to imagine how the other actor is going to say the line, the different ways they could. And then uh, it comes with like understanding their con- character, understanding your character, inter- understanding your character's rea- or interactions between each other. Um, and then you give three takes per line and, and send them off. And sometimes they, you know, just say, hey, that's great. And other times they give you, can you fix one or two lines? And most of the time they'll tell you like needs to be annoyed or something like that. Yeah. It's like a little emotional tweak. Yeah. Uh, and then for time purposes, again, because uh, sometimes, you know, you're, you're swamped with lines or you're not, sh- you know, if I go in to record and I give lines and they, let's say there's like 40 lines and I go through all the lines and they say, oh, uh, these are great. Can we get more like this? And uh, you have to go through essentially and re-record the whole script just for more options in that situation. Uh, I'll normally, if there's more than like two or three lines, I'll say, hey, can you spare the time to to hop online and go through this with me? Because, you know, I only have a certain a lot of time because I'm trying to do so many projects per week or per day. To support yourself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, because you're if you've been recording a whole bunch of lines, your voice starts to go out over time um, or you just get tired energy wise. Like it, it's a thing. So I try to put in a certain amount of hours and and just work those hours. And so if I have to go in and record a script two or three times, I'm going to just ask the director to hop online so that we can get that one take, nail it, and and go on. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, less less worry for you as far as, like, vocal fry or, like, you know, the detriment to your instrument and, and mm-hmm. what you use to support yourself. Yeah, and sometimes it's it's even better for them. Like, I, I talked to a game dev uh, two weeks ago where, where that happened, where they just wanted more options. And uh, I, I hopped online with him and we went through everything. And he was like, I got to say, I, I actually really like this because rather than having to spend two whole paragraphs explaining what I want, I can just talk to you real quick and you can get it, try it. And then we we nail it and go on. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, I've done I've auditioned for a voiceover thing before. And, and it, yeah, it was kind of this thing where I did a few takes and uh, with the sound guy and he was like, OK, tweak this a little bit, tweak that a little bit. And uh, then they called like the. I guess the, it was for a um, would have would have been for a uh, like a car dealership mm-hmm. basically, and then they called the owner of the dealership and kind of played it for him. And it was a little frustrating for me because I feel like I'm pretty good at tweaking my voice in what way, whatever way that someone would want. But not being able to get that direct feedback was a little bit harder, especially as someone who hasn't really done this as much. Mm-hmm. So I think I mean having someone there is. I'm sure infinitely better. It's, it's definitely, a, especially like when it comes to auditioning, a lot easier to just, you know, if somebody says, Hey, can you change this a little bit? Uh, it's a lot easier to do that than say taking a shot in the dark where you're emailing these auditions and going, man, I hope from the character breakdown that that's uh, what <laughs> right. they wanted. And I teach yeah. this class kind of about like analyzing character artwork, uh, analyzing scripts and, and trying to figure out exactly the characters from those those little clues that we get for auditions to try and help bookings. Yeah, that's smart. So how uh, you've mentioned that class that, uh, a couple of times. I was, I'm kind of curious, how, how long have you been doing that? And uh, how did you kind of stumble into that opportunity? Or did, is that something that someone sought you out for? Or did you, did you apply for that? Or is it something you run on your own? It's something I, I primarily run on my own. I've taught at a couple of colleges here and there, uh, some colleges, mainly in Oklahoma. Ironically, I think I've taught at every college except for the two I went to in Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> but all the other ones, I, I'm pretty sure I've, I've got down. Um, and then I've taught at some out in California. Um, and now I just teach on my own most of the time through Skype so that anybody can take them. Uh, I got my bachelor's degree in theater performance and then there weren't really any voiceover classes that I could take. Um, and especially ones I could afford to take just because price wise, like some, I think the closest one was in Dallas and it was like 600 or $700. And just as a college student, I couldn't afford that or the weekend in Dallas. So now I teach on Skype for about, uh, my intro class, which is two hours is 35, $35. Um, so I try to teach for people who want to get into this field that maybe, you know, it's not the, uber duper professional levels but it's that that start off course to be like hey 
you know, here's how to get your feet wet. Here's how to, to start finding auditions. Here's how to set up your home studio kind of thing. Cool. Awesome. Uh, so is that, is that like through your website? Is that how people like contact you for that or? Yeah, people can, I think like Twitter is where I spend most of my time, like sending out tweets, like, Hey, here's this. And I have an email list, uh, that goes out normally on the first of every month. And it's got, you know, casting calls that I, I help cast projects for. Um, and so that'll go out through there. And then I have classes that I'm teaching or just random little tidbits. Um, I run a site called sunnybluestudios.com and that's where most of my classes are listed, but they're also sometimes listed on my personal website. Cool. Awesome. I'll have to direct my roommate there. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's currently taking like voiceover classes and, you know, I keep coming back to the apartment and there's like more random, like, like vocal stands and like pop filters. <laughs> I'm just like, all right. He's, he's, he's starting his, he's starting out for sure. Aww. Yeah. Awesome. So I guess maybe on that note, Rachel, if you kind of want to tell us a little bit about where we can find you, um, this is kind of maybe your, your chance to plug, um, uh, you know, your Twitter, you mentioned, you mentioned Sunny Blue Studios. Uh, I know you have an official website, so you want to kind of tell us about, uh, where people can find you most often, I guess. Yeah. Um, so I try to update my website pretty frequently, um, which is just rachelmesser.com. Uh, I spell my name a little not even like super differently, but apparently it's different. Everybody tells me it, uh, but it's like R A C H A E L and then Messer M E S S E R dot com. And then I'm the same on Twitter at like eight at Rachel Messer, and then same on Instagram. I keep it keep it the same. <laughs> and yeah, I think you can you can find me through there. Twitter is where I'm pretty uh, like I, I don't do a whole bunch of Facebook anymore. Like I have a Facebook page, but I constantly forget to upload like up stuff on there and the fact that you have to pay to show it to all the people who liked your page is just mm -hmm. something I'm not, yeah. not about. So most of the time, Twitter, if you want to see like any new role announcements or uh, hopefully soon, I'm, I have a sneaking suspicion that over this weekend is when they're going to release something publicly so that I can announce it publicly. Oh. So if you want, just check out Twitter and that's where things will probably be more frequently. I'm almost tempted to ask you because I know by the time we publish this, that'll probably be out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if I were sure. No, right? Yeah. And like, I wouldn't want to get in trouble. Are you able to say if it's a, if it's a big studio or, or like, an indie thing or, or you can't even say that you, I mean, I don't want to get you in trouble. Yeah. Just because I, I take NDAs so seriously. I, no, I'll, yeah. I'll send you a tweet and be like, this is the project, by the way, you can, <laughs> you can link it in here to solve everybody's the, the Curiosity. burning question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's awesome. Uh, that, that's what happened with us. Uh, Natalie Rowers just announced something yesterday or today. And I was like, Oh, that's what she was talking about a month ago that she couldn't say to us. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, well, that's fine. We can wait. We're excited for it. Um, like I said, I I knew I had to be able to speak with you after I'd started forgotten half or forgotten in, and I was about halfway through it, and I was like, whoever voiced her is fantastic. Um, it just pulled me in because it's I, I Matt and I play a lot of games, and so um, we're I, I'd like to think we're pretty cognizant of the people who voice those games. Mm -hmm. uh, we pay we pay a lot of attention to that, and so. Um, I wanted to make sure we were able to talk to you a little bit about just voice acting in general in that role um, as a mm -hmm. whole, because uh, that game was, I don't know, I, well, I assume you would know the whole story then since you recorded for it, but it's just, it's fantastic. And uh, I thought you were great with it. And uh, it's, I don't know, it's probably one of my games of the year this year. Um, oh in my terms gosh, of that. thank so, you. Appreciate you coming by and, and speaking with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Well, you know, you're welcome you. back anytime too. Uh, you sure. know, any any future projects you have that you can't talk about right now, <laughs> <laughs> you're always welcome to come back and plug them anytime or anything you've got going on that you want to kind of just come on and share with us. Uh, we love having people back too. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, anytime you see, I mean, you guys, I think, reached out to me on Twitter. So, like, anytime you yeah, see I something did, on yeah. Twitter and you're like, hey, you want to come back in and talk to talk with us about it, just send me a message. Yeah, absolutely. I promise 100% <laughs> less technical difficulties next time. So. <laughs> <laughs> now that we figured it out. Now that we've got it down. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Rachel, thanks again for joining us. Matt, as always. It's been a pleasure having you here with me by my side. Oh, thanks, Robert. I, oh. I never thank you. I guess I should. Oh, thanks. You know, That's so nice of you. I'll give you a raise this week. hey -o. <laughs> <laughs> So I add another zero to what I'm paying you. <laughs> <laughs> so many zeros, Rob. Uh, yeah, How can you afford that? <laughs>
Because <laughs> it's just zeros. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Again, guys, this is We Are One, You Are Two. Uh, this is our Inside the Industry interview with Rachel Messer. Uh, until next time, game on. Game on. This is the outro music for this week. Maybe if you subscribe, I would put your name into the outro music. Ah! I like it. (laughs) I like it a lot. (laughs) Uh.